All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of our evolution seminar series. Uh, today, we'll be putting on our phylogenetic thinking caps as we are joined by Zhidang Tang, works in the Solus Linus lab in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get right into it. Please join me in welcoming Zhidang Tang. Um, thank you. Can people in the back hear me? Okay, cool. Um, hi. Thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, I'm Shido. Uh, I work on um, deep learning application in phylogenetic influence under the supervision of Dr. Salas Limas at Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. And um, today my talk is about graph representation learning in phylogenetic inference. So, sorry. So phylogenetic, uh, uh, so, so graph representation learning is uh, a subset of deep learning. And deep learning is the model behind every fancy AI stuff you heard in the news for the last 20 years. Um, so we have examples such as um, ChatGPT or AlphaGo. Um, fortunately, we're not gonna talk about any of those during this talk. We're just gonna stick to phylogenetic inference. But uh, unfortunately, it's not as exciting because unlike those very fancy stuff in the news, we are actually, um, we're actually struggling here because phylogenetic picture is a very funky little uh, structure that doesn't really work well with machine learning stuff. So um, this talk is gonna be a lot more focused um, statistic and math. So, uh, so if anytime you guys have questions, please feel free to interrupt me and stop and ask a question. I'm happy to answer at any time. Uh, I'll also stop uh at after every session to see if anybody have questions okay so before we start talking about deep learning in phylogenetic i think it's better to spend a few minutes on the, the basic of deep learning um it seems like a very complicated idea but um it's actually not that hard it's a very simple idea so to understand what a deep learning model is we're going to start with a simple linear regression for those who don't know about linear regression uh, we can look at the top figure here. So linear regression is the model where we try to fit a line to represent a relationship uh, between x axis and y axis uh, on that plot. So give an example here, all the black dots could be students. And then the x axis could be number of hours a student spend uh, for study every week. And y axis could be um, their midterm score, for example. And then we fit a straight line here to see how those two properties are correlated with each other. Now, um, linear regression is cool. It's uh, widely used in um, uh, a lot of statistical applications, but um, in the real world, uh, not a lot of stuff has linear relationship. So if we take a look at the bottom figure here, we have a lot more data points and they're not on a straight line. They're in the shape of a McDonald's symbol. So uh, there's no way we could fit a reasonable straight line to represent the relationship between x axis and y axis here. So um, ideally we do want a curved line like a McDonald's symbol, right? Um, there's many ways to do that. And deep learning model, or shall we say a neural network is one of those ways. It's actually really simple. We just wrap around a function sigma outside the, the linear regression uh, expression. So this stigma has to be a nonlinear, non-polynomial, continuously differ differentiable function. It doesn't make any sense, but um, there's really not much choice. In, in re re reality, we, have, like, we only have like five uh, possible choice for this stigma function. And uh, we call this function an activation function. What it does is make a straight line nonlinear. So this is a simple example of a neural network. We call this a vanilla neural network because it's the most standard go-to neural network if we're talking about deep learning. It's like the vanilla ice cream. You think about ice cream, you think about vanilla, right? Um, so we have several components that's a, that are pretty important here. We have the X matrix. This is the uh, input where we, this, this is the stuff we want the model to see. For example, the students, our, uh, uh, hours for, for, for studying every week. Um, this is marked in the blue circle. We have the uh, output, Y marked in the red circle. This is the, um, 
the stuff that we want the model to tell us about. For example, did the student do good in midterm or not? And then we have uh, the uh, hidden computation units. We call this hidden layer. Uh, we have two here. The first one is in uh, green circle, and then the uh, second one is in yellow circle. So those are the, the hidden parts where we do all the actual calculation to get our um, results. Just give me one second. Okay. It's not available. I'm sorry. Apologies, everybody. Just some technical difficulties. Okay, fine. Okay, so hidden computation unit. Um, it's the uh, hidden calculation that we actually do in the neural network. We don't understand anything about it. It's a black box model. So we only care about the input and the output. So how do we get those computation going? We have two parameters, two set of parameters. The first one is weights marked in W here. And the second one is bias marked in the gray circle here. So those are the trainable parameters in the training process. We adjust the number of those parameters so that uh, the calculation correctly represents the relationship between X and Y. Um, there's a lot of te uh, technical stuff going into this um, calculation. There's a lot of calculus. So I'm not showing it here, but just bear in mind, we change the bias and weight during the training. X and Y is fixed and uh, the, the hidden units H, we don't understand any of those. So we don't talk about it. Um, so, why do we want to do deep learning? There are so many good phylogenetic inference methods out there. They work really well. Why bother going into a very different field? Well, uh, there's a theorem in deep learning called the universal approximation theorem. I put almost here because it almost never works in reality. Um, but um, yeah, the, the theorem is pretty cool. It looks like a monster theorem, so nobody's going to read it. But uh, I'm sure this is very simple. Let me explain. The blue, the blue, um, the blue characters here are constraints that nobody cares about. Uh, the only important stuff here is the red ones. So let's say we have a function fx. The fx is function that we want to learn about. For example, uh, for phylogenetic inference, fx could be uh, mapping the sequence alignment into a topology. So we want to learn about fx. What we want to do is, let's say we have a sigma that is not a polynomial function. Remember sigma from the previous slide? That's the activation function. And then here we have an expression that says there exists another function, gx, that is really, really close to fx. So this, uh, this line here in math means two functions are really similar. Uh, their, their, difference is, their difference is smaller than any given positive number. So epsilon here could be 0.00001. Nobody cares, it's just really small. And then we can express g x in this equation. Um, it seems pretty familiar, it's really familiar, familiar to us because this is actually a expression for neural network. So I provided too long that didn't read stuff here. So what we're saying is given the function fx that we want to learn about and under certain constraints, there's always gonna be a function g x in the form of multiple uh, neural network layers that could approximate the original function fx with in, in, infinitely small difference. So as long as there's a, a, a fx that we're interested in, in theory, we could use a neural network to best approximate it with very small difference. Uh, uh, but in, in reality, it doesn't really work. But um, the theorem is proved, so it's good. Um, also, the previous uh, theorem is in Euclidean space, so fx should map a a Euclidean space uh, data into another Euclidean space. But we know that for phylogenetic tree, the tree itself is not in Euclidean space. It's a tree space, right? Uh, but luckily this theorem also stands for non-Euclidean space, such as graph space. It's not important now. It'll all be important in a few minutes. So the last slide for the introduction. Uh, what do we do with deep learning models? So we uh, split deep learning tasks into two main tasks. First one is supervised learning. This is the uh, most important stuff for deep learning. This is the most well-studied cases. What we do here is, well, we know the sample and the, the property that we want the model to see, but we also know the ground truth about this sample. So by ground truth, for example, here, we have 10 written digits. The ground truth means we know what is the correct digit for each of those pictures. 
So for um, uh, for supervised learning, what we do is let's take this uh, data set as an example. We feed this uh, head written digits photo into the model. Each pixel is a model is a sample feature, and then we try we we, we ask the model to predict what is the correct uh, uh, actual number. And then for the training part, we actually know what is the correct number. So we know the difference of the model prediction and the ground truth. We call this ground truth label. Um, so in this case, we can train the model so that it can predict the correct label uh, as much as possible. And in the testing part, what we do is we only feed in the, this picture and we have the model tell us what the model thinks is the correct number for this. Um, the other one, uh, While well, it's less well studied, it's a much harder task. It's unsupervised learning. It's very common in biology fields because uh, in biology, it's really hard to um, know about the ground truth. So let's say given a DNA sequence without doing extensive uh, experiment, you have no idea what this sequence, what, what, what property this sequence has, right? So getting the ground truth in biology is really expensive. So in this case, um, we are training the model with no ground truth or label. Um, so we, what we're given is the sample itself. Uh, for example, here, we're giving a bunch of photos of animals. Those animals are under carnivora, uh, and we, we know nothing about their species or what their name. So what we want the model to do is that we want the model to group those animals into two parts that uh, share similarity between them. So ideally, the model should group those uh, photos based on the photo itself to um, cat-like animal and dog-like animal. There's a name for those, I forgot again. Um, but um, uh, yeah, but even the model, after the model group them, the model still don't really know this, the green ones are cat-like and the red ones are, are, are dog-like. Um, but yeah, it only does this task by finding the similarities uh, based on the sample itself. Okay, so do we have any question about the basic parts? Okay, so let's go on to the uh, to the uh, deep learning models in phylogenetic inference. So as I mentioned before, we are actually struggling with um, deep learning here. There are multiple proposed uh, model uh, for deep learning application in phylogenetic inference. I list the paper here on the on the right. So the task is pretty simple. Given the sequence alignment for species, we want to infer the tree topology by doing a classification task. Um, so even though those models have many difference in their te technical parts, the major, uh, the overall workflow is very similar. So we're given the sequence alignment for species. And then we, we the first thing we do is we represent those uh, sequence with a much shorter vector. Uh, this is pretty common in machine learning. It lowers the dimension, makes the training easier. And the, the next part is where the, all the problem comes from. What we do with the topology itself is we label them. Um, so let's say a four taxon unrooted tree. There's only three possible tree in, in, in the uh, whole tree space. Then we just simply label them zero, one, and two. So we discard all the information about the tree and only mark them with one single number. And then we feed the vectors, you know, the vectors that represent the sequence alignment into the model. And we try to have the model tell us out of the three trees that we labeled, which one is the correct one, tree number zero, number one, or number two. So I'm providing an example here from, actually it's a model coming out of our lab. Uh, I did uh, some extension work on this model, but I didn't develop it. My name is here only because of, of alphabetic order. Um, but um, yeah, it was, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty cool model. It's, it has strong mathematical proof and it got some really clever idea. The reason I'm showing it here is even though a model with uh, many thinking put it into it, we're still struggling because the base idea is going into a dead end. So the model here, what we're trying to do is eliminate the need for permutation shown on the, uh, uh, the, the figure here. Uh, so the model has invariance property. By invariance, I mean, uh, for example, look look at type type one tree here. A B on one side, C D on the other side. If we swap A and B, it's still the same tree, right? If we swap both sides, it's still the same tree. So if the model could uh, see all those eight equivalent tree as the same tree, then the model has invariance property. 
Um, so uh, since the model has invariance property, we don't have to do permutation. So we don't have to feed all eight equivalent tree into the model. It saves a lot of time and computation resources. Um, so, uh, but the, uh, the, the model still follow the, the workflow that I mentioned in the previous slide. It treats tree part topology as labels. So here we have three types of tree, then we have zero, one, two, you know, three labels. It all works up to five taxons on rooted tree. I know it's really underwhelming because nobody cares about five taxon tree. Um, it, but it does outperform standard phylogenetic inference in long branch attraction cases. The long branch attraction cases only occur, occur in um, four taxon on rooted tree. But um, uh, most phylogenetic inference method doesn't work for LBA cases. This neural network does. Um, the performance starts deteriorating really, really hard on and after five taxon tree. So for five taxon tree, it merely work. For sex test taxon, it doesn't work at all. Um, oh, I should remove this slide, but okay. Anyway, <laughs> it's uh, it's just showing how the, 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 the standard workflow goes. We have, uh, let's say this tree, AB on one side, AB on the other side. We have a descriptor that describes every possible tree that's equivalent in this uh, uh, as this tree. So A B on our side, C D on the other side. And then uh, we feed all of those into a neural network. We get a probability number to describe how possible this uh, tree topology is the correct one. So things, let's say if we're talking about unrooted four times on tree, then there's only three possible tree. What we do is we have three descriptors each account for all three uh, type of tree which and all, all the equivalent kind of trees. And then we end up with three numbers, P1, P2, and P3. Each is a probability of how likely the model think uh, this type of tree is the correct one. So then we choose the biggest probability out of three, and this is the correct tree that the model think. Um, this is the result for uh, unrooted four taxon tree. We compare this with uh, standard phylogenetic inference methods such as uh, maximum likelihood and uh, Bayesian inference. So the first row here is the uh, non-LBA cases. You can see that all the methods have similar performance. The second row and the third row are long branch attraction cases. You can see the neural network, which is in uh, pink and uh, yellow here, and also green. Uh, they uh, they are. Uh, the, the, the result is much higher than the standard phylogenetic inference method, which are stuck in the bottom because they don't work in this case. Um, yeah, so it actually works in, in cases where the standard phylogenetic inference doesn't work. This is the uh, result for five taxon cases. Uh, in this case, there's no LBA problem anymore. Um, so this is where things get really bad. The maximum accuracy we can get for neural networks shown in the yellow uh, line here is 72%, uh, while maximum likelihood got 94% and neighbor joint got 91%. We also have to talk about the time spent in the training. We spent four hours to train the neural network and end up with 72%. We spent 20 seconds for maximum likelihood, and that's like 20% more accurate. So no reasonable person would say, oh, I want to use neural network to do this task, right? Because you know it takes much longer and it's worse. So why do we still do it? There's good stuff come out of it. We, we show that you know, even with this neural network, we solve the LBA cases, which the standard phylogenetic inference method could not. So if there is a functional relationship between them, we can use a neural network to actually explore them, right? But then there's many problems with this. The first one, not the biggest problem, but still a problem is we are transforming the tree topologies into a, a Euclidean space. By that, I mean, we discard the whole information about the tree, the ancestor and child node relationship, the branch length, everything into one single number. It's either zero, one, two, or three, you know, depending on how many trees are there. So in this case, we leave a lot of important information for a phylogenetic tree. And then the most uh, ugly part is um, the, that we're treating those, uh, the, 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 those trees as labels. So for a four taxon unrooted tree, there's only three the type of tree in the tree space. So choosing one tree out of three tree is not a very hard task for neural network. But let's say for a 10 taxon tree, which is not really a big tree, it's still a small tree. We have over 2 million possible tree in the tree space. So we're what we're trying to have the neural network to do is we are giving a number, a probability number to each of these 2 million trees 
And then we try to have the model to choose the biggest number out of 2 million for us. Now, this is unreasonable. Nobody's going to give an actual number to 2 million trees, right? Um, in this case, it's just unreasonable to, to train a supervised model with more than 2 million labels. So we have two problems that we need to address. First thing, we want a model that could directly represent the tree, the tree topology. We want everything that's in the phylogenetic tree to be represented in the model. The second thing is we want a model that could uh, avoid a complete search on the tree space. By com complete search, I mean the, the model would um, explore every possible tree in the tree space. There's two ways we can do this. We can either do a heuristic search, which I think is what the standard phylogenetic inference method are doing, or we could not do in a tree space search at all. Um, so to, to address those two problems, I, uh, I propose two models. The first one is a graph model that solves the um, uh, topology issue. And then the second one is a generative model to avoid doing uh, tree space search. And I'll talk about this in depth later. Uh, since we're starting to talk about graph, here's a graph. Uh, a graph is a, uh, a, a way to represent the relationship between nodes. In this case, this is a knowledge graph. You can see a dog is an animal, which is a living thing. It makes sense. It is easy to understand. So let's formally define a graph under the context of a phylogenetic tree. Now we're starting to talk about looted phylogenetic tree because in my model, it works better with looted ones. Uh, we're using a four-tax four-tip tree as an example here um, because it's easier to draw. Um, we have um, we have all the nodes that's the, that have to be in the graph. By node, I mean here A, B, C, D are the pip node, and 0, 1, 2 are the ancestor nodes. Those are the set of all nodes V. And we have E, the set of all edges. The edge is the one that connected the nodes. So E, 0, 1 is the edge that connects 0 and 1. Uh, that's the same for all the ed all edges. We have node feature matrix, and each row is a feature vector for each node. So let's say the first row of feature uh, node feature matrix is a feature vector for A. For phylogenetic tree, this could be the uh, DNA sequence for each species. So we have a DNA sequence for A, B, C, D, and also we can infer those sequence for the ancestor nodes as well. Um, and we have the uh, edge feature matrix. Um, so each row has a, a, a vector for, for the edge information. But for phylogenetic tree, the edge information is just one number, the branch length. So in this case, it's not really an edge feature matrix, it's an edge feature vector with a number representing each edge. What is a graph model? It's uh, a very broad term. I would say any model that train or test on a graph structure data set with the idea of message passing is, is, a, is a graph model. And what is message passing? So to put it simply, message passing is Let's say we have a phylogenetic tree. Each, each node have a, a, a sequence associated with it. And uh, message passing is we for each node, it'll learn the uh, sequence information from its neighboring nodes. So at the end of message passing, each node feature would not only contain information about its own sequence, but also the sequence information from all the neighboring nodes. So the idea actually derived from the original uh, neural network which we talked about in the first few slides where we have uh, each layer getting the, the, the value from the previous layer by doing uh, matrix multiplication with the trainable weights and biases. Now, what we do is we would have the, uh, uh, the, the, the feature vectors as, 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 um, as uh, layers, and then we update the feature vectors for each node during each iteration. Uh, we do similar stuff. We, we do multiplication with the weight, and also we add another two matrix here. Uh, B is a diagonal degree matrix. This is the matrix that indicates how many nodes are connected to each node. And then A is a density matrix. This is a matrix where uh, it tells about the connectivity between each node. Not really important here, but it's just a component for the graph. I will show how this works in a very simple way. Uh, I actually had the full calculation at the back of the slide, but uh, I figured that's a little bit uh, too much for uh, showing here. So if anyone's interested, I do have the calculation. So let's say the initial layer, we have um, the uh, sequence alignment for all the nodes, S8 to S2. So this is the initial layer. Each one of 
those are a node, fe node, node feature vector. So for the, for the second layer, so if we do one message passing, we would uh, have a function f, which it contains weight, all the matrices that I talked about before, uh, with the information about each node itself, and one uh, it's, it's the ref neighbor. So let's look at node A here. It has information about its own sequence, and also the sequence information about the ancestor too, because it's one uh, node away from itself. And you can check that this is the same for every other node. If we have look at uh, F, um, the node feature for two, F2, it contains A, B, one, and two. So A, B, one, and two. So it contains, every, every node co contains itself and all its direct neighbor. Now we do another message passing. It includes one more neighbor to itself. So if we look at uh, the, the node for A, which is marked in red here, we contain itself as A, uh, as two, which is uh, included in the last layer. And then as one and as B, this is one more neighbor. So you get how this works, right? Every time it includes one more neighbor to its uh, own feature vector. And by the end of message passing, each node would have information about itself and all the neighbors that we're interested in, we define how many layers we want. So we don't really want too many layers because uh, at the end of the day, the, uh, every node would include information about the whole graph, they'll be the same, right? Um, so yeah, this is how we, uh, we learn about the relationship of each node in the graph. Now, how would this work on phylogenetic inference? There is not really a lot of uh, applications on graph model in phylogenetic inference. There is one that I can find. This is in the reading material uh, by John. Like, uh, I think it's not published. It's a preprint, uh, uh, like three or four months ago. Uh, but what they do is they're given the graph topology. They train the model using the graph model, and then they get the final feature vector HT. So it's like a feature vector for each of the node in the graph. And then they use this vector to do other downstream tasks. Um, I don't understand those tasks because they're like really biology. But um, yeah, but what if what we want is the topology itself? We are given the notes. Uh, what we want to know is how is the topology look like? So in this case, we need to actually generate the whole whole tree, right? So we're looking into the uh, the, the graph generation. An example is on the left here. Um, for, let's say graph G is the correct graph that we want to have, and then the generation process here. Is one example of how graph are generated. This is a sequential generation, one at a time. So graph generated model, why do we need those? We need those because there's a few characteristics of the phylogenetic inference problem. Um, the first one, as I mentioned, we don't want to learn anything about the topology. We want to, we want to infer the topology itself. Uh, so we don't have the topology available for the testing set. The other thing is, um, what we're given is only the sequence alignment for the nodes, uh, the, the, the tips, the species, right? We have no information about their ancestors. So to get the information about the ancestors, we actually have to do inference from the, uh, from the child of each ancestor. Um, so without knowing the topology, there's no way we could uh, know anything about the ancestor node. So the problem really become, we want the whole tree given only the sequence alignment for the species. So what we're saying is, let's say there's 10 nodes in the tree. We're only given four of them and we want the whole tree. This is a, really a lot to ask, but this is what we have. So let's formally define a graph generative model. What is a graph generative model? So given an observed graph set, let's say we have n graph, in this graph, we have everything we need. We have node, edge, all the features, and we want to train the model to learn the distribution of this graph. So we want to learn the pattern, the, the, how, uh, the similarities between all of those n observed graph. And then we learned a distribution, P model G. This is different from the true distribution. This is a close approximation that the neural network does. And we want to sample a um, new graph, uh, GK from the learned distribution P model Z. We could also put additional information um, on this new ge newly generated graph. So we could condition an extra information Y uh, for the, the P model Z to generate a new graph. 
Now this doesn't really make any sense. So let, let's translate this into a phylogenetic inference problem. It's actually very direct. Um, so we're given known topology of an n taxon tree set T. So we have n T's and n m trees. They have each of them has n sequence alignments in the set of S i. Um, so we know everything about those M trees. We know about the topology. We know about the sequence alignments. We know about the branches, everything we need. Now we want to train the model to learn the distribution of those P, P trees. So let's say we, there's a true distribution P, T, and then we learn the, the distribution P model T. So what we want to do is a conditional generation. So since for the uh, phylogenetic inference problem, we are given the sequence alignment for the species and we want the topology. So we are conditioning this um, uh, learned uh, distribution of the tree on the known uh, sequence alignment for the species. Uh, and then we generate new trees based on that. Um, there are multiple uh, generation methods. Uh, one shot generation is the most po popular one. It's the most well studied one. If you guys remember from uh, two weeks ago, Dr. Smith presented the GAN network. That is a, a, a one shot generation, a very, a very classical uh, way of doing so. Um, so what it does, it maps the whole graph into a set of vectors. And then we sample, we, we generate a new graph by sampling directly from those, uh, those um, uh, vectors. So every node and every edge are generated at the same time. There's no sequential order with them. Uh, it's very good at maintaining the global property of a graph since everything's generated at the same time. Uh, and also we have the sequential generation, which is the less studied one because there's a lot more constraint on those models. So what it does, it, it generates uh, the node and edge one by one. So at the beginning, there's nothing. And then at a node, at an edge, at another node. Um, so how it generates a new node on the edge is based on the existing graph. So let's say we have two nodes and one edge for the graph. The, the, the third node is uh, generated based on the, the, the current uh, generated graph. So it's very good at maintaining local dependency since everything is generated one by one, but it's really, really terrible at maintaining global property. What I mean is, let's say we had already have 99 nodes in the graph and we want to generate the 100th one. So it would learn a lot from the 99th node, but it forgets everything about the first node that it generated. So who knows if there's any relationship between the first one and the 100th one. The model would forget about it. So it's very, very terrible at maintaining global property. So intuitively, to, intuitively we want to go with the, 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 the more popular model, the more well-studied ones. Um, because they also have like a simpler, a simpler constraints to do. Uh, but um, in this case, it doesn't really work for one shot generation. And the, one of the major things here shown on the figure here is we only know the ancestor nodes by inferring from the child node. So uh, without uh, having the, uh, the, the two child, no information is doing for the ancestors, right? So there's a very strong dependency between them. We have to do a bottom up generation. So what, what, what I'm saying is we, we have to have two species node and then an ancestor node, another species node, and then an ancestor node, right? Since one shot generation generates everything at the same time, you know, there's no such dependency that could be followed. So it would violate the property of a phylogenetic tree. So sequential order it is. So before I actually present the model that I'm working on right now, uh, let's go over what we want to achieve from the model. First thing, um, it's uh, no complete search of the entire tree space. We want to solve the, the, the main struggle we face for all the current deep learning uh, methods. The second one is we want the inferred tree to have tips with specified sequence alignment. So this is actually just the, 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 the problem of uh, phylogenetic inference given the sequence alignment for the species, give us uh, the, the topology. The third one is the inferred tree need to follow the dependency between ancestors and child nodes. So the ancestor nodes need to base on the child nodes. The fourth one, uh, the inferred tree and the neural network could be evaluated easily. By this, I mean, we have to know how the model is doing. Um, so since we're not labeling the topologies, we're not doing supervised learning. 
Um, so for unsupervised learning, it's really, really hard to know how the model is doing. Um, so we need to come up with a clever way to evaluate our model. And the last one is the model should be as simple as possible. I know there's many fancy models in deep learning. We have, you know, those GPT models and then transformers. We don't want any of that. We just want a simple model that anybody can understand and they can actually use it with their best knowledge. So, okay, here comes the model. Everything's actually in this uh, flowchart. I will go over this one by one in the next few slides. But let's talk about a brief overview. So as I said, we're doing a sequential generation to follow the rule of phylogenetic tree. And also, we don't want to do an unsupervised learning problem because it is hard. It is hard to evaluate. It is hard to train. So what we do is we break down this unsupervised learning problem into multiple supervised learning problems. Uh, so you can see the, the, the um, blobs that are marked in color here. All, all those blobs are a neural network, and each of them is doing a simple task. The green ones are doing a yes or no question. So it's a two-way classification. The model either answers zero, which means no, or one, which means yes. Or it's, it has a regression problem where the model simply give you a number after you're feeding something. So it's break down into multiple very easy tasks for the model. Uh, and eventually, after running all over the models, we would have a result. And then this model would in, uh, include every component in a phylogenetic tree. So we have the topology, we have the sequence alignment, we have the branch, the branch length, everything you need to transform it back to a new wave format so that it could be evaluated easily. The bad stuff, well, it's extremely hard to code. Um, there's so many models in here. Uh, there's like dependency in the code, so it takes time. And since uh, the model is still in progress, I, I think in theory there's nothing bad come out of it, but who knows, you know, it's a neural network. Um, so let's go over this step by step. So here we have uh, three steps. V is the uh, all the current uh, nodes in the existing graph. In this case, we haven't generated anything yet, so it's empty. S is the uh, is the uh, set of all the species that we could choose from in a phylogenetic inference problem. So the example here is a looted four taxon tree, but I will show later that it will work for bigger tree. So we have four species to choose from. And D here is the graph itself. Since there's none here, the graph itself is also an empty set. We start from the beginning. We have the existing graph G, in this case, nothing. And then we do a message passing for a latent vector. So what, what I mean is uh, we would have a vector, uh, a feature vector for each node in the graph, and then we find a way to concatenate them. There's no node here, no feature vector, so it's all zero. Next thing we do, this is a neural network. So we feed, into, feed the feature of the latent vector into the neural network and let the model tell us, do we want to add a new node or not? Let's suppose the model says yes. In this case, we add a new node, we call it M. We know nothing about this node. It's just a new node in the graph. No sequence alignment associated, uh, no topology associated. Now, another neural network, we ask the model, is this new node a leaf node? Let's say the model answers yes. Then we have to use yet another neural network to choose a, a, a species from the set S. So we now since there was nothing in the in the graph, the set contains A, B, C, D, the whole set of species. Let's say the model choose A. We remove the, the a, we remove A from S, and then we add A to V. So now A is the only existing node in the graph. So now we ask the model, do we want to add an edge to it? Since there's no other node in the current graph, there's nothing to add. So we go back to the very top. Now we have an existing graph G, which only contains one node. We do a message passing. Since it's just itself, the message passing doesn't change anything about the node. It's just its own sequence alignment. Now, the same thing, we ask the model, do we need to add a new node? The model answers yes. Is this, model, is, is this node a, a leaf node? The model answers yes, we choose from S between B, C, and D. Let's suppose the model choose B, right? Do we add in any edge? Uh, in theory, we could add an edge between A and B, but somehow let's say the model decide not to. So we go back to the top. Um, now we have two nodes. We still do a message passing. Since they are not connected in any way, no information is passed between them. So we directly concatenate two sequence alignment together. 
and then we go through the whole process again. You know? Yes. Let's say this time the model decides this is not a leaf node. This is a a a, a internal node. So we, what we do is we need to generate the uh, sequence. It should be sequence here. Uh, generate sequence for for this um internal node zero based on the existing graph, which is A and B. Now zero is generated based on the sequence alignment for A and B. So we would want zero to be the ancestor of A and B, right? So we ask the model, do we want to add an edge? Let's say the model says yes. So we would need to pick from A and B to add a, a, an edge from. So let's say the model pick B. Now we, we go back, we do this again. Do we want to add another edge? Let's suppose the model says yes. And then we add another edge to A. We go back, do we add another edge? Let's say no. Then we go back to the top and then we do another message passing. In this case, zero is connected with A and B. So there is actually message passing happening. Uh, A, B, and zero would not only contain its own sequence information, it would contain the information of its ancestor. I'm not gonna go over the whole, like the whole, whole, whole process, but I actually have the whole process in the back of my slide. Uh, it's, um, but you get how, how it works. Every time the model, uh, we, we ask the model a question, the model makes a decision and we proceed with this decision. So the only termination um, the determination condition here is the time where model decides, I don't want to add a new node. So if the model says, uh, no, I don't want to add a new node, then it means the tree construction is complete. And then we have to evaluate this tree. But in this case, we would have everything. We have all the tip nodes and their sequence alignment. That's the same as the given ones. We have all the ancestor nodes, which are uh, inferred from their tips. And also we have the branch then since we infer this using a neural network. So we can actually transform it back to a network format and evaluate it. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys wanna ask, what if the model doesn't generate stuff in my way? What if the model decides the first node should be an internal node and the second one is a, a, a leaf node, then there's no relationship between them, right? And that is the most important part in this, in this uh, model. So, uh, so, so, so the stuff I showed before, this is, um, this is the process in the actual generation part. Now we have to train the model to learn about the, 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 the distribution of the trees. So during the training, we could actually decide the generation order. By that, we, I mean, we can force the model to, to generate a known topology one by one. So in this case, I show a seven tip tree here because it's more complicated than four tip. And I wanna show that it also work here. Um, so what we wanna do is we would strictly enforce a post order generation. Uh, so the post order generation is the order of left, right, and center. So let's look at this four tip tree. Oh no, seven tip tree. So we start from zero. We go left first, we go to A. Now we go left, there's nothing in the left. We go right, nothing in the right. So we, we generate A. We, and then we mark A off this graph, we already generate this. We go back to the middle, we can go right. No, left, right, center. We did this to the last, right? And then we go right. And now we're at one, we go left first, we're at four, left, we go to B. Now B doesn't have left or right, so we, we generate B, and then we go back to the middle. We can go right again, so we go, right, go, go to right first. C, we have no left or right, so we generate C. We'll go, we go back to four. Now the uh, left and right child of this uh, node is already being generated. So it's the center part. So we generate four. Now four is visited. We go back to one. Now we also, we, we already finished everything on the left. We go to the right. Two, D, nothing, nothing left and right for D. So we, we generate D, go back to three, and then left, left to E. You, you get how it goes. We go, uh, go to E, go back center, right to F, go back to five, three, and then go back to the right, to G. And then all the tip nodes are visited. So we go back to the other centers ones, you know, three, two, one, zero. Um, so since the phylogenetic tree is always gonna be a binary tree, this uh, post other generation order would always be uh, strictly enforced by the bottom up, um, by the bottom up uh, order. So. Uh, if you look at here, let's say the, the, the ancestor node uh, for B and C is four. Four is generated after we know B and C. Five is after E and F. 
three is after five and G, and one is, is after four and two. So each uh, ancestor node is always being generated after their, uh, their, 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 their child node. And also I want to point out that we don't have any, uh, any uh, big space to search anymore. So I'm using a lyric of space oddity here because I like that song. Um, so if we're doing the old uh, deep learning way, we are exploring all the possible trees in this space. So for a unrooted seven taxon tree, we have 945 possible trees to, to count. For a rooted one, I believe there is more, but uh, I forgot the equation for that. Um, but yeah, there, there should be more. Um, but um, if we're doing it in our way, we are actually doing a lot of small questions for the neural network to answer. Most of the space to search is two. It's either yes or no. So there's only two data space to search. The first one is S, where the neural network has to choose the, the, the leaf node from the set of species. Um, it's um, this, this one. So in this case, the biggest number we have is seven because there's only seven species. But uh, in, in most cases, it's, it's actually less than seven. Let's say we already choose A, B, and C in the, in the existing graph. Now we only choose from four, B, F, G, right? So seven is the biggest number. The same goes for V. So um, at this step, we need to pick a node from V to add an edge to. So uh, the space to search is all the existing nodes in the graph, which the biggest number is 13. But uh, in the beginning, it's much smaller than 13. So let's say we only have, have three, uh, three, um, three nodes in the existing graph, then we only choose from three, right? 13 is the biggest number, it's in the final set. And also I wanna point out that the increase in, in, in the space to search is uh, linear when the tree gets bigger. So for a 10 taxon tree, our rooted one is over 2 million possible tree. I believe for rooted one, there's even more. But for, the, uh, for our method, uh, there's only 10 species to choose from. And I believe 19 nodes to choose from. So the increase is linear. Uh, even if you have 100 uh, tips, S would be 100 and V would be less than 200, I think. So it's, um, it's, it's a much smaller space to search. Now, did we accomplish our mission? So let's check each of the stuff we want the model to do in theory. First thing, no complete search of the entire tree space. We are not searching the tree space. We're only learning the tree distribution and the space to search is much smaller. Um, and the increase is linear, as I mentioned. Do we have tips with specified sequence alignment? Yes, because in the algorithm, we actually choose the leaf node from the uh, species set. So this is enforced in the algorithm. Do, do we follow the dependency between ancestors and children? Yes, because we're doing, in the training, we're doing a post order traversal. So um, um, we are always doing a bottom up generation. Ancestors is always generated after its child. So yes. Could it be evaluated in a reasonable way? For the tree, yes, because we have every component of the tree. So we have we, we can just transform it back to new it and do an RF distance. For the neural network, it's even easier because we're doing like a, like a yes or no question. So there's a correct answer for the training part. If the model generates an internal node or an ancestor node in the, uh, as the first node, then it made a wrong choice, right? It should be a leaf node. So there is a clear evaluation matrix for the model. And is it as simple as possible? I would argue yes, because even though we have so many neural network models, all of them are very simple neural network models that just do a yes or no question or choose from a, a set of numbers. So we don't really have those fancy ones like transformer or even the convolution neural network. It's just a very simple, good old vanilla neural network. I believe if anyone spent two weeks uh, to read a basic book about uh, deep learning, you can understand every last part of this neural network. So it's really simple. Now what's next? Well, obviously I have to code it. Um, it's really hard to code, as I mentioned. And also the training process, since um, this, this generation process is solely dependent on how I train it, I need to train it really, really carefully. 
So the only the, the, the constraints that I put emphasis on right now is supposed order traversal, as I mentioned. But there might be other stuff that I have to observe. It's a deep learning model, it's black box. I don't know what's going on with the training. So you can only observe what's going on with different training process and see if we need to control anything. Uh, I would like to thank my PI, Dr. Salas Limus, and the, uh, uh, my, my colleagues in the lab for their support. Thank you. I think I can take questions. So uh, one question I have is, uh, what is the largest tax on set that you have applied to this model so far? When you think about the, the size of the data sets people are working with nowadays, or hundreds, even thousands of individual species that mm -hmm. can be included in a tree. How far have you gone? So Seven. Seven. Yes, because, um, well, I mean, it's a very underwhelming uh, number, but uh, the, the biggest number that uh, we have, like the, the, the biggest data set we, we have for the neural network is actually five, because most model current model wouldn't work beyond five. That's why, you know, one step at a, at a time, if it works for seven, we do 10. And then if it works for 10, then we do 20, you know, so that we don't stretch our leg too much. Yeah, but the aim is at least a hundred, because I mean, a hundred is still not a big tree, but it's still a reasonable size tree. I'd say a thousand is a little bit too much for this model, because, you know, you just have to choose each node from a thousand uh, possible candidates, right? It's a little bit too, too big. But I think a hundred is reasonable. Yes. What kind of sequence alignment do you imagine? Are you using like one gene or is it a total? Uh, okay. Uh, protein sequence for each species. I'm not sure what those really are because, like, you know, I'm a data scientist, people give me data set too wrong. So, well, I guess, given that question, though, the, the question is, you know, does this method scale as a sort of length of that data set gets longer? Um, do you mean the tips the, the tips get bigger? Yeah, or? The line, as, if the ones went from, I don't know, a thousand to uh, a million. Would, would that have a negative impact on um, your, uh, your success? I, I would say the length of the sequence wouldn't matter because we apply a a, 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 a way to embed those sequence into a much shorter uh, vector. So a million, a thousand, we still do the same thing. We might end up with a hundred length vectors to feed into the model because the model wouldn't understand much from the original sequence, right? We have to provide a way for the model to understand the sequence itself, they should always going to be shorter. But if we're the, the scale problem is about, you know, how big the tree is, then yes, it would be a very uh, it will, will will have scale problem. Let's say we have like like I said, if there's there, there's a, a thousand tips, it's still going to be too much for a neural network in the current stage. Whether it's a thousand characters in a sequence alignment or a million, it's, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really matter. matter. Yes. Oh uh, yes, actually it is a uh, part of the model. Let me check. Uh, so here, after we pick a, a node from the, the set V to connect it to, we actually infer the branch length. How we do it is um, when we are training the model, we have the branch length, right? So when we generate this, when we're generating this branch, we, 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 we would have a correct number that how long this uh, branch should be based on the sequence alignment we have. Um, so this is a tricky problem for neural network because it's not giving a yes or no question, it's giving a number. So we don't really know like what's the correct number and how, how, how different is considered too different. But, Yes, the model would give a number. How good it is, I'm not sure. Uh, 
Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, it's um, this part. So, you know, we have to choose a, a, a species from the species set to put in the in the chip nodes. Uh, so if there's too many species to choose from, if there's a thousand species, then we have to choose one from a thousand. It's a, a, a lot to choose from. And also we need to come every time when the new node is added, when a new edge is added, we need to choose where this edge is going to. And that's from like all the existing nodes in the graph. Well, I mean, there might be some restrictions I can put on it because if there's a tip node, you can never connect anything to the under the tip node, right? So there's there's a bit of like a constraint that I can add to, but I'm not at that stage yet. Oh, it's gonna be so so much worse. <laughs> yeah, because like um the standard phylogenetic inference methods are, are fast. They're really fast. Yeah, and even the Bayesian inference which is not the fastest ones are so much faster than a neural network because, well, we have a training process here, right? So if we have the model and then we're just, you know, we have a trained model and we'll generate everything, then I think the performance should be similar, but we have a, 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 a pre-process, you know, we have to train the model first and it takes, I don't know, sometimes two or four hours, sometimes two or four weeks, who knows? Yeah, if it's like a, 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 in a thousand uh, species tree, then I would imagine it'll take even a month. So, but you know, after the model is trained, I would guess that the the, the, the generation process is just, you know, you every time you input a number, it does a calculation, get an output, it should be fast based on how you compare it. But like we always include the training process uh, into the uh, model model, the, the time consumed by the model. So it'll not take much longer than any existing uh, biogenetic inference method. So I mean, it's still, it's it, it, if it works, it's it's like a, if it works in this way, then we can prove that deep learning can work beyond four taxa, right? And that's a good base for further development because you know all deep learning models start from very silly task, and look at what we have right right now for like ChatGPT and you know like twenty years ago when you ask a a a a a, a deep learning model uh, is this uh, like. This, is this an apple? You might say yes, you know, but um, we all have to start somewhere. All right, well, if there are no more questions, please join me and thank you.